Good afternoon. Welcome to lecture nine. Today, we will talk about money and banking. But before we get started, let me just catch you up with what we said in the previous lecture. So we talked about economic growth. Uh, we said that uh, economic growth is exponential. There are two kinds of economic growth, the catch-up growth and then the sustained growth. We had a brief tour in the history of economic growth before the 1800s, and then we talked about the change that we had in the Industrial Revolution. And finally, we talked about the Malthusian cycle, a theory that was stated by Malthus, and uh, this was in, uh, in the end of the 1700s, and Malthus actually related the growth of population to the growth of the real GDP. We talked about inequality and, prov and poverty. Then we had a deep dive into the solo growth model. We talked about the production function, the accumulation of capital, the saving. And then in the end, we finished lecture eight by talking about causes of prosperity, climate, geography, culture, institutions, and history and some other random factors that they do affect the economic growth. Today we'll talk about money and banking. We'll start a brief tour about what money is, but most importantly, what money is not. We'll talk about the money supply and the money demand. In other words, we are going to make an effort to just relate the money supply and the money demand into a market and try to understand how the market of money actually works. And then in the end, we'll have uh, a very brief discussion about inflation and how inflation affects our society. We'll talk about hyperinflation, and I will show you inflation rates around the globe and what happens with inflation in general. So let's get started with money. First of all, money. Uh, every year, the value of the global GDP totals about 80 trillion. And uh, don't forget that we need money mainly to buy stuff. So if the value of the stuff is around 80 trillion, we should expect that the value of money should also be the same in order to be able with our money to buy the stuff. However, you will see that this is not the case. The total quantity of money circulating around the globe amounts to just 6 trillion instead of 80 trillion that the real GDP is. Money is neither a good nor a service. So money is not a good itself, it's neither a service. Therefore, its value is not included in the GDP. So this means that the 6 trillion value of money is not added to the 80 trillion or is not even part of the 80 trillion. So why do we have this discrepancy between the total quantity of money and the total quantity of the total value of the GDP. What happens here? And we do have this discrepancy. All right, the reason, if you think about it, is that money actually is used for transactions. And with the same dollar bill, you can transact more than one product. So I can buy something with my dollar, then the person who will receive my dollar can also buy something, and then this dollar can actually facilitate several transactions instead of just one. So money is not one use, and therefore we should not expect that the total quantity of money should be equal to the value of the total GDP. Money is not a good, is not a service, but it is an asset that facilitates our transactions. So its job is actually to make the transactions in the economy easier. What does this mean? That money is kind of a lubricant of the system and its basic role is to intermediate transactions. I could put this in a, in a slightly different and maybe better way of understanding it. Money, what it does is it tries to break transactions into two parts. Let's put a comma there and start an example to understand what is going on. So assume that after I finish the recording of this lecture, I have to go and buy eggs. So I need eggs for my home, and I will need to go and buy eggs. So this transaction, as you probably imagine, will not go down in any different way than me 
going to Cheers and I will be like, oh, I want these eggs and here is the money that these eggs, 270, I think, the eggs that I buy. So here's 270. You give me the eggs, I give you 270 and this is what in everyday English we mean by transaction. However, this is not exactly the full story because what I'm actually exchanging for these eggs behind the curtain, under the hood, is I exchange what I produce with what some egg producer produced. So I actually exchanged teaching of economics with eggs. Now, the person who owns these particular uh, chairs, he was not very interested into receiving economic knowledge. Okay, maybe he had it from before, maybe he could just not care less. Therefore, I could not go there and be like, listen, give me those eggs and I will teach you what opportunity cost is. So I cannot do that. Instead, I break the transaction into two parts. The first part is that I sell my service and I get money. And the second part is that I give the money and I get the eggs. Okay, so that's why we say that money is kind of the lubricant of the system. So it's the common denominator in economic activity. All transactions are converted into a monetary value. So instead of negotiating how much economics I should teach the egg producer in order to receive the eggs and how many eggs this guy will give me, instead of negotiating that, we just go to markets, simpler markets, in which I sell my education services for money, he sells his eggs for money, everything has a common denominator, money and transactions are made uh, much easier. Some strange facts about money. Money is not very straightforward. Let's see some things that maybe will make it a very, very interesting for you. So the paper currency that you probably have in your pocket today is most likely to have not value at some point in the future. So a few decades in the future, this currency that you have in your pocket will have zero value. Not because of inflation, but simply because we are going to change currency, or we're going to change, not not, uh, currency in terms of uh, Singaporean dollar or something like that, we're going to change uh, the the bills at some point. Uh, We have better technology, better quality of uh, of paper. We need to put new drawings or higher security uh, uh, paper notes in the future. And therefore, we are supposed to, to have the currency updated at some point. Or maybe we will change form of currency entirely, and and the paper money will not be useful anymore. So, what you have today in your pocket, it's possible that at some point in the future will will not have any value. Like, for example, in 1999, if you had Greek drachmas, or German marks, or French francs, after a year, none of this would be valid for direct transactions you should convert everything into euro because the currency actually in the European Union changed. So therefore, the value of money is not actually embodied into the currency. It's actually represented by the currency. Gold now, which is a much more a much more usual standard over time. So gold always used to have value and most likely will always keep having value. But gold will not be very useful to you in the Sahara Desert. Imagine that you are in Sahara Desert and you have 10 kilos of gold with you. That's not going to save you from thirst. Or even at the, at the university food court, if you go to, uh, to uh, Khufu and you try to buy a, a sandwich with a little bit of gold, the guy will just look at you like, what are you talking about? So uh, gold is actually, does have value, but doesn't have very much transaction flexibility as we expect with cash. Most apartment complexes in the U.S. will not accept cash payments for their rent. This is something that everybody knows in the US. If you rent an apartment, most likely you have to write a check, transfer 
the money from your bank account or have a direct payment with a, with a credit card or, or a debit card or something like that, but you cannot walk into the lease office and you say that here is $900, I want to pay the rent for apartment uh, 208. Okay, so you cannot do that. Why those complexes will not accept cash? Actually, it has happened to me once my, uh, back then when I, was, uh, when I was a student and I was renting a flat in the U.S., I would uh, pay with check every month. And one month my checkbook was finished and I had to pay the rent. So I went there and I had the cash and they didn't accept it. Okay, why they would never accept cash in those complexes? If you know the answer, write it down below in the comments so you'll see, the first person will win a prize. You cannot pay the New Jersey turnpike tolls, the road tolls in New Jersey for the highway, uh, with a $100 bill. Actually, there is no rule or regulation that prohibits you from doing that. But once I was traveling from North Carolina to New York, and I, I had to go through the New Jersey turnpike, and I only had a $100 uh, bill on me, Know that I was wealthy. That's um, pretty much that was all my money back then. And uh, I stopped in the tolls and I didn't have, I didn't even know that I had to pay tolls. So I see the toll station in front of me and I take the 100 bill to pay. And that was crazy. People in New Jersey, they are not very friendly as they are in Singapore. And drivers that they were behind me until I negotiate how I will pay the tolls. Also, they were not very friendly, and I don't think that they liked me. So you cannot pay with, with big money. You cannot pay small, uh, uh, small debts in, in some particular cases. You cannot buy cocaine with a credit card. I haven't tried that, but uh, from what I've seen in the movies, if the guy comes and uh, you're like, okay, do you take uh, credit cards? he's not going to be very friendly to you and he's going to be definitely more hostile than people in the tolls in New Jersey were to me. So that's not a good idea. Uh, avoid doing that. So illegal economy cannot actually work with money that can be traced. Credit cards are money that can be traced. So this gives it a very different property from the other categories of money that we have in this slide. So uh, the point of this slide is to actually let you know that not everything is straightforward with money. Money is kind of a, a mysterious good. It's not very, uh, very clear what kind of an asset it is because sometimes it has a lot of value, sometimes it has almost zero value, and we have to try to understand how this, how this works. Now, the functions of money, money per se is not income and is not wealth. Okay, so when, when you, you work and you make... Uh, uh, for some particular period of work, you make $1,000 for, for, for a project, let's say. So you made the $1,000. This means that you didn't actually make $1,000. You made a value. You, you actually uh, are entitled to have a value equal to $1,000. All right, so it's not per se income or per se wealth. Alternatively, uh, a barter system, alternatively to money, if we didn't have money, we just, we just uh, have an economy that works without money here, then in this case, what you will see is that it would require a barter system that you directly go on and you transact one thing for another. Like I said before, uh, sit down, I will teach you what opportunity cost is, and you will give me eggs. So this would be a direct barter. Now, this would require double coincidence of products. Like the guy would be... I have no problem giving you eggs, but I don't need what you're actually offering. I would need some, uh, some courses into uh, egg making or something like that. And uh, if you are able to do that, then I will give you the egg. So you should have coincidence of what I offer and what the other, people, uh, the other person wants and also what the other per person offers and what I want. So this is not an easy coincidence to happen. Double coincidence of quantities should be also uh, a, another requirement here that the quantity that I can give them and the quantity that they will give me, they should be what we each other want. And finally, double coincidence of timing. The guy would be like, 
oh, you know what? Teaching of economics will be very useful when I was 18, 19, 20, but now that I'm 47, believe me, I, I can do without economics any, anymore because I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, farming eggs. Okay, so in this case, you should have all these three uh, different things that they will go on. In simpler economies, this would not be a big problem. Like, I remember uh, in the summers, I used to go to my, to my grandma's uh, 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 little house in a, in a small village. And the economy there, the transactions there, they were not very sophisticated and it was back in the 80s. So people actually were uh, not buying, you know, like online stuff and, and, and things like that. The internet didn't even exist. So I remember very, very often that uh, my grandmother would be like, hey, come here. Take this little bag of one kilo of green beans and go to this neighbor over there in the other house and ask her to give you one kilo of tomatoes. So we'll trade green beans with tomatoes one to one. Okay, so this was something that you would do, you could do if it was uh, a simple economy that transactions were not as complicated as they are today. So people... They, they used barter for, for a very long amount of time. Now, today, or in general, money has three important roles. And this actually holds for any kind of money that you can think about. The first role of money is it's a medium of exchange. This is what we already described. It's an asset that is generally exchanged for goods and services. So this is an asset that anything that is accepted uh, in as for goods and services, in exchange of goods and services, this would serve as money. Number two, it's a store of value. It's an asset that actually will have the necessary durability to be able to transfer purchasing power from one time to another. For example, today I am recording this lecture and I'm going to send it to you so you will be able to see it and this is part of my job and therefore the university will pay me for this. And the money that I will receive for doing my job today in March of 2020 maybe will be spent in a month, maybe will spend in a year, maybe it can be spent in 30 years or maybe it can be spent by my ancestors sometime in the future after they inherit some purchasing power in terms of money from me. So I can store value from doing this lecture today, taking money, money can be stored one way or another and transfer the purchasing power into the future. And the third role of money is that it is a unit of account. That is, it's a universal standard used to count the value, the price, or cost of anything you want. We can actually appreciate in money anything you might imagine. From how much a tomato costs, up to how much a tanker ship will cost, up to how much a human life will cost. Okay, there was actuarial estimate of values for almost everything. One's actuarial uh, professional one day was invited to estimate the value of the rear end of Jennifer Lopez, who she wanted to insure it against a very important sum of money. So there was a person who actually had to evaluate how much the rear end of Jennifer Lopez would cost in money. In, in case that something happened to it, I, I don't know what it might be. It was a publicity stunt, but actually the contract existed and went, and went on. Now, money has some uh, very important properties. It's anything, first of all, that is uh, generally accepted as a medium of exchange. So money is not only the dollars, the, the rubles, the, uh, the euros, all these currencies that, that we can exchange easily for goods and services. This is not only the money. Um, uh, there are various forms of money through the history, and not only the history, some of them, uh, I, will, I will explain to you some of them uh, very briefly. Uh, they happen even today. They, they go on even today. Silver, gold, 
uh, in the older times, goats, chickens, horses, or cigarettes. And cigarettes is uh, an example that, that is, is a very interesting one. When I was uh, in the army, they, uh, uh, I, I was in the United States, and then uh, I had to go to do my, my army service in Greece. So I went to Greece, and I, I, uh, I joined the Marines, and they decided to send me uh, for a year, that was my, my service supposed to be, to send me to Cyprus. So they sent us there, and since uh, uh, we were abroad, the government had to take care of some other expenses that they do not take care of soldiers that they serve in Greece. Uh, soldiers that they serve abroad, they, they actually have a little bit more benefits. One of the benefits that we had was that every month we were entitled to receive for free or almost for free, uh, tax-free, which was almost uh, at a ridiculously low amount of, of money, two cartons of cigarettes. And when I was in the army, I was not smoking. Okay, I had quit smoking several years ago. I smoked very briefly in my life, but I had already quit smoking several years ago. But I would go every month and I would get my cigarettes, 20 packs of cigarettes, two cartons of cigarettes. And there was a very specific reason why, a specific reason why I would want to have the cigarettes. And the reason was somebody would say to sell it and get the money. No, it was not that. It was that in the base, because most of the soldiers, they would smoke, in the base, cigarettes had a form of money. So you could have one pack of cigarettes and have somebody to accept to take your clothes to washing and then bring, bring them back to you. So they would do your, your laundry for you with one pack of cigarettes. Or somebody else, could, if you had to guard from 2 o'clock up to 4 o'clock, which would break your night's sleep in the middle and it's horrible, somebody who had already 12 to 2 would accept to extend his number to do 12 to 4 for two packs of cigarettes, one per hour. And in this case, you could get a full night's sleep with cigarettes. So we could exchange cigarettes, even if I was not smoking, I would take the cigarettes because they had exchange power. In other words, they were money. And actually, it was so specific, you know, soldiers, they have a lot of free time. And it was so specific that for everything, there was a rate. There was a going rate for someone, somebody doing your guarding, somebody doing your clothes, somebody offering any services that somebody uh, might need, like skipping the skipping the line in the barber shop inside the inside the uh, the barracks and everything so there was there was a rate almost for everything in this case uh, some general properties that money is desired to have if you have money anything can be used of money but there are uh, some assets that they can be serving better as money than other assets for example Money should be generally accepted. Okay, everybody would be, uh, should be able to, to accept the money. For example, imagine that we ha were using horses for, uh, for money, and then uh, in the end of the month, I would go to get paid, and the university would be, okay, Cosmas, here is four horses for, for this month. And I would be like, how can I put like, like four horses in a two-bedroom apartment? That, that, that would be kind of hard. Okay, so they would, I would have a storage problem in this, in this case. So it should be generally accepted. The more generally accepted it is, the better it would be. Or imagine that we're using gold, and there are some, uh, uh, a very small amount of people that they have a lethal allergy to gold. Once they come in touch with gold for some extended amount of time, they will, uh, uh, they will have a shock and they will probably die from that. So imagine that you were allergic to paper money that we use today, uh, your life is ruined. Like, you will not be able to actually uh, do almost anything in your life. Also, money should be portable. Uh, it should allow you to carry it in different places, so it will facilitate the transactions in a better way. There is a very good example about that. In ancient Greece, there was the city of Sparta and the city of Athens. And these were kind of enemies, they would, they would become friendly only when the barbarians, by barbarians we mean anybody who was not Greek uh, back then, 
So uh, when the barbarians were coming to, to, to conquer Greece, they would get united and they would be friendly to each other, but in normal times, they would be very, very hostile to each other. And they also had a lot of differences in terms of how they organized their economy. So the Athenian economy was kind of a capitalistic economy. People had money, they would collect gold, you had wealthier and you had poorer. The Spartan economy was a much more centralized economy. And they discouraged collection of money, like somebody uh, collecting big amounts of money. They would allow you to have big amounts of land, but not money. And the way that we were able to enforce very easily this limitation of how much money you can have, there was no hard limit. They would just make the coins being made of iron and very, very big and very difficult to carry and store from one place to another, carry from one place to another and store them somewhere securely. So therefore, they would discourage of people having uh, big amounts of cash. It should also be durable. This means it should last from one period to another. This is very important. For example, if you had your money in goats, let's say, then you went to bed and you were wealthy and then a wolf came down from the mountain and then you were poor. It should be controllable in quantity, meaning that you should not be able to reproduce money just like that. Uh, when I was a kid, we were playing with my friends, uh, as I told you, in, uh, in my grandma's uh, uh, little village. And I had several friends there and we would play like we had nothing else to do and we had no video games or anything, so we had to play with our hands and with sticks and stuff like that. And then we said that we are going to organize something like that would involve a little game that will involve some transactions. And we will go to trees and collect leaves, like big stacks of leaf, and we will pretend that these were money. And if you had a lot of them, you would be very wealthy, like, oh, look at me, like, and you would, you would be like that with money. Uh, but then the problem was that everybody could go to the trees and, and get leaves and actually have a lot of quantity of money and be, be wealthy. So in this case, we very quickly understood that if somebody is not able to control centrally the quantity of money somehow, then in this case, what you will have is that the value of this, uh, of this will very quickly converge to zero. It should be objective value carrier. This means that the value of money for one person should be the same with the value of money for the other person. Now, for everything that is globally accepted, that's not going to be a big problem. For example, uh, I was not a smoker, but I would take the cigarettes because this could be used as money. Somebody else would be a smoker, so would actually consume some of its money, in other words, directly by smoking it. Okay, but in general, it should be an objective value carrier, mean that it should carry some particular value that is common for everybody. A lot of people use diamonds as a good example of that. Diamonds are very expensive, but guess what? They are very expensive when you buy them. They are not that expensive when you need to sell them for some reason. So even if a diamond is not any kind of jewelry that involves a lot of art, and somebody might not be appreciative of this particular style of art that this ring or, or necklace has, for example, a diamond is just a diamond. Nobody is going to take it and process it into something else into the future. So we should expect that they have the same amount of value. However, they don't. Okay, they have a, a different value when you buy them and a different value when you sell them. They lose 20, 30, sometimes up to 60% of the value when you, when you resell it to somebody else. So it should be objective value carrier. It should be easily denominated, meaning that if you have horses to use as money, uh, horses are particularly big animals, and then you want to go and buy uh, uh, just, just a piece of candy, uh, how are you going to do that? You, okay, you give the horse, they give you the, the candy, and then you, they give you what for, for, for change? Okay, so it should be easily denominated, and finally, it should be difficult to counterfeit. This was a, 
a, a very good uh, property and why people were using goats and chickens and horses because it's very difficult to counterfeit a, a horse or a chicken. Actually, if you are able to counterfeit a, a horse or a chicken or any form of life, congratulations, you will make much more money from that than just using what you counterfeited for, for, for money. Okay, so that was one of the advantage of uh, livestock being used as, uh, as money. Today we use uh, uh, fiat money. Uh, fiat money is money that was uh, pretty much invented around 1000 AD in, uh, in China. One of the very, very few things that were invented in the ancient times and was not invented in, in Greece, by the way. So modern societies have switched to using fiat money everywhere in the world. Uh, fiat money is something that is used as legal tender by government decree and is not backed by a physical commodity. All right. If there is just one thing that you will remember from today's lecture, this is that the paper money that we have today, the dollar, the euro, any form of money that you, you can imagine, is not backed by something. And I say this because there is a rural, a myth, actually, that states that the central bank cannot print money unless it will have gold or silver to back it up. This used to be truth before the 1950s for some places in the planet. It's not true after the 1950s anywhere we do not have this even remotely to happen today. So money that we have today is not backed up by a physical commodity, usually gold or silver or anything else. So fiat money is valuable only because we have agreed to accept it as valuable. So this actually involves a social contract that you accept that this little paper with this drawing of this guy that is on it will be called the American dollar and this has some value. The other currency that is pink and it writes 10 and it has another guy on it and it says Central Bank of Singapore will be accepted as the Singaporean dollar. Okay. So we agree that these have value. Now, if I come to you and I give you a Russian currency, I give you a 10,000 ruble banknote, in the beginning, unless you have experience dealing with this economy, you'll be like, oh, wait a second. I don't know if, how much is that. It's 10,000. Yes, but I don't know how much this 10,000 maps to real value, to real GDP, what I can buy with 10,000. So immediately, before you are able to actually learn how much this actually is worth, you will not accept it. Because why? Because there is no trust. Okay, in order to accept currency, you have to trust the issuer of this currency. So fiat money is valuable not because it's backed up by a physical commodity, but because all people in the society, in the particular society, have agreed to accept it as money, to accept that it has value. So the value of the fiat currency is not intrinsic. The value of gold is within the gold. The value of silver is within the silver. The value of the horse is within a horse, and the value of a car is within the car. Okay, but fiat money is not worth almost anything. For example, a $50, a $50 Singaporean bill will cost something like five to six cents to make per unit or maybe less. All right, so the value, the intrinsic value is not the same with the value that this currency represents. So it's, it's, the value that it represents is not intrinsic. We do not accumulate dollars because we like them we accumulate them for exchange, for storing value, and for keeping accounts. All right, so because we trust that this particular form of currency will be used for these purposes also 
in the future. Let's now investigate the supply side of this asset that we call money. So we will talk a little bit about the system, the entire social system that supports the creation and the function of money in our society. From the supply side, money has different definitions depending on how liquid an asset that we use for money actually is. So here we will talk about two main definitions. First of all, we will talk about transactions money. We will denote this by M1. M1 is the most liquid form of money. Transactions money, M1, is money acceptable for most transactions as is. In its exact form, we can take this particular asset and exchange it directly as is with anything that we want. And this actually sticks to the example that we said a little bit before about why in the school cafeteria they will not accept gold in order to allow you to buy a salad or a burger. So gold is considered to be an asset, a relatively liquid, but actually is not M1 because cannot be used for transactions as is. So by M1, we mean cash held outside banks or checkable accounts. A checkable account is an account that you can actually spend without going and withdrawing money from there, meaning that you can use a check, you can write a check, so the other person will have the money transferred directly in their account, or you can actually have a credit card which directly will transfer money from your account to the other person's account. So a checkable account, a checking account, any account that is represented by a card or a checkbook, or just cash held outside the banking system, this is what makes M1. So M1 is equal to cash held outside banks and checkable accounts. And then we have a broader definition of money. We denote this by M2. And M2 additionally includes relatively less liquid, liquid assets than M1. That is, it includes everything that M1 includes plus fixed term accounts. A fixed term account is an account that you put your money there, but you lock them for a specific amount, a fixed amount of time, if you want to break this deposit earlier than uh, it expires, you will have to incur a transactions cost, meaning that you will have to pay something like a fine in order to take your money earlier, or other semi-liquid financial assets, like for example, government securities. If you, if you buy a government bond, then this will not be accepted directly for transactions, but very easily you can liquidate it, you can cash it by paying some transactions cost again for selling it to somebody else. In other words, your broker will sell it to somebody else. And this is a semi-liquid financial asset that then you can convert it into money very easily and spend it. So M2, the broad money is equal to whatever M1 includes plus fixed term accounts, plus some semi-liquid financial assets like the one we said before. Sometimes economists use the M1. M1 is very specific to what it, uh, it, it contains and there is no room for misunderstandings because some of the semi-liquid financial assets are difficult to be uh, to be defined what exactly they are, which ones belong to M2, and which ones of them they would belong to an even broader money supply, the M3, and goes on, M4, M5, etc. So the main advantage of M2, however, and why sometimes economists use it, is that M2 is more stable over time. So a transfer from a checkable account to a mutual fund will decrease M1, but will leave M2 constant. Why is that? Because if I take money from my uh, checkable account, my checkable account 
is part of M1. And I transfer it to a mutual fund. The mutual fund is a collection of bonds. So it's actually a semi-liquid financial asset. So I will transfer from M1 to this part here. M2 will not change. But M1 will change because you are transferring this somewhere outside of this. So M1 will be decreased. So because M2 is broader, some transactions within M2 will not affect M2 and it appears to be a more steady variable than M1 usually appears to be. Now, money is actually supported by a, a system that the government has put in place. This is called the central bank. In every country, the monetary system is run by a central bank. It's a government institution for monetary authority. Now, contrary to its name, a central bank is not a bank. It's a bank only for the banks. The commercial banks can use it as a bank, but it's not a bank for normal citizens. Like, I cannot go and start an account in the Central Bank of Singapore or in the Central Bank of England or in the Central Bank of the European Union. So it's not a bank, it's just an institution that has some regulatory role in the economy. The Central Bank operates almost completely autonomously from the rest of the government, and this is very, very important. Now, let's discuss a little bit about that because sometimes theory and reality, they are a little bit different. We have observed that the more advanced an economy is and the least corruption an economy has, the more independent and autonomous the central bank will be. All right. So, for example, in the United States, if you go to this week's news, you will see that Donald Trump, the President of the United States, actually issued statements, official statements, that means tweets, according to him, in which he talked against the central banker of the United States because the central bank didn't do what the president wanted it to do. Okay, so the, the, the central bank is completely autonomous in the United States. It is completely autonomous in England. It is completely autonomous in Switzerland, in Singapore, in many, many other countries with advanced economies. The influence of the government to the central bank is completely uh, 100%. All right. Now, in some other countries, this is not the case. For example, when I was in Russia, the head of the, of the central bank was the wife of one of, of my colleagues at the university. And we would ask, like, how autonomous this, this, this central bank actually is. And the guy would say, oh, no, it's completely autonomous, but... So the degree of how autonomous an economy is actually has to do with the quality of institutions in this particular country. Now, the central bank has some particular roles. First of all is to monitor the financial institutions. So actually it's the regulator of financial institutions. Not all of them and not always all of them. But if you are officially, according to the law, a bank, then you're under the regulation of the, of the central bank. Uh, some other shadow banking institutions, they might escape from the regulation. They, they used to be escaping in the past. Uh, the regulation is expanding and expanding to include all the institutions that they act as banks one way or another. But however, this cannot be perfect because you know, even retail stores today, sometimes they act as a bank. Instead of giving you a loan, they give you a fridge and then you pay installments for the fridge in the same exact way to them, in the same exact way that you would pay it in a bank. So it's very difficult to define what a commercial bank actually is in a, in a very narrow 
uh, narrow perspective, and therefore, and therefore, the central bank is the regulator in general, but sometimes you might see exceptions that some institutions that they act as banks, they are not under the regulation of this, of this central bank. The second role is to set the money supply, and this goes together with the third role, which is to control the interest rate. So you will see that number two and number three, they are interconnected together. You cannot do one without the other. And by the end of today's lecture, this will become totally clear. These activities are jointly described, all these three things that the central bank is doing, all these three roles, they are described with one word as monetary policy. So monetary policy is policy that is done mainly by the central bank, not by, uh, by the government so much. Uh, government can have some role in monetary policy, but most of the time the monetary policy is run by the central bank in every country. Now, what are the particular functions of the, of the central bank? First of all, the central bank is the coordinator of the banking system. So coordinates the entire banking system. And it performs very important functions. And without those functions, today's particularly sophisticated banking system would not be able to function without having these services and functions from the central bank. What are those? First of all, the central bank regulates the banking system. So the banks, they are not unregulated. They follow some specific regulation and they have to follow this regulation. There is severe punishment if a bank avoids the regulation by the central bank. It assists banks in a difficult financial position. Banks have to meet some particular constraints in their operation. And sometimes this might not be possible. Like, for example, imagine that several people are going to a particular bank to withdraw their deposits from there. But this particular bank has used these deposits to give loans, or at least a, a bigger part than normal, to give out loans to some other customers. And therefore, right now, currently, this bank doesn't have the funds to meet the increased demands of people with, demand of people withdrawing their deposits. This means that somebody has to fund temporarily this bank so it will be able to pay their deposits to its customers. And this person, this particular institution, will be the central bank. It manages exchange rates and foreign exchange reserves. How much currency every particular bank will have depends on the regulations of the central bank, on the recommendations, actually, of the central bank. The central bank, in general, manages the exchange rate in a way that will become apparent in the lecture after today's lecture. The fourth important function of the central bank is to clear complex interbank payments. So imagine that you have three banks. Bank A, Bank B, and Bank C. Bank A owes $100 to Bank B. Bank B owes $100 to Bank C. Bank C owes $100 to Bank A. Now, if you make a little triangle, A, B, C, and you put arrows to the debts from everybody to everybody, you will see that these debts, they actually cancel out. Nobody has to pay anything to anybody because everyone, A, B, and C, they're owed $100 each, and they owe $100 each, so everybody can clear their positions without paying anything to anybody else. The problem is that by themselves, the banks do not know that. Bank A knows that it is owed $100 from Bank C, and it owes 
$100 to bank B. They don't know the debt that exists between bank B and bank C and how this cancel out. However, all these debts, they go through the central bank. The central bank has a complete map with what everybody owes to, to everybody else, and therefore can cancel out complex payments that banks cannot do by themselves. The fifth important duty of the central bank is that it sets the reserve requirements for all financial institutions. In general, banks make money by lending money. So ideally, every bank would like to find worthy projects, worthy entrepreneurs, to lend them all the deposits that they have at a good interest rate so the bank can make profit. If this happens, the bank might be in a very difficult financial situation later when some of the depositors, they will ask for some or all their money back. So the central bank imposes a restriction on the commercial banks and it tells them that you should actually reserve some particular amount of money to hold it as reserves in case somebody needs to take their deposits or more than the average people will want to take their deposits. So the central bank requires that every commercial bank keeps a portion of total deposits as reserves at the uh, central bank's uh, uh, deposits or as cash. So they should be able to prove that in the end of the day, they have the required reserves for this particular day as the central bank defines them. This is known as required reserve ratio. The required reserve ratio, we denote this by RR, and it's defined as a percentage of the commercial bank's total deposits. So if RR is 0.1, it means that this bank, in the end of the day, at closing, if it has a deposit of 100 billion, they should have 1 billion in cash or deposited in the central bank in the end of the day, or else they will have to do something. Most likely, they will have to borrow this amount of money at the kind of expensive interest rate from the central bank or from other banks in order to be able to close their positions for the day. If they are not able to close their position, the central bank will actually force them to do it. It's not up to them. They have to be able to prove every single working day that they meet the reserve ratio. Now, the commercial banks. The commercial banks are the banks that me and you know. The banks that we go there, we deposit our money, they give us a nice card with nice drawings on it, and we go and we scan it and we buy stuff and uh, we, we lose track of prices because that's what you do with a credit card. You actually don't know how much everything is because as of magic, you give your card and you, you just buy the good. Now, behind this transaction, the bank actually transfers the amount from your account to the account of the, of the seller, and there is a real transaction between this seamless transaction with a credit card. So commercial banks actually intermediate something that we saw in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we said that I is equal to S, meaning that investment equals the saving of the economy. How does this happen? It happens because investment is coming from the savings of the economy. So S becomes I. Who does that? Who bridges these two things together? The commercial banks do. So the commercial banks accept deposits from people who want to save and loans this money out to other people, how we call them in economics, firms that they act as investors. Now, accepting deposits, as we already said, is cost for banks. The banks actually pay in order to receive deposits. In general, a bank is like a company. Okay, any kind of firm that we have, done, we have talked about so far. So accepting deposits is kind of the raw materials for this bank. So you buy your raw materials, which is money, by convincing people to 
place their money with you and you have to pay for that. What you pay is a part of your cost as a bank. All right, so accepting deposits is a cost for banks, accounted as a cost. The profit comes from the loans that they give because they are getting paid for uh, the interest rate. More recently, actually, currently, we are in a, in a transition situation. Several banks have changed the model of operation that they have. In other words, they charge almost for all the services that they perform right now. From the one hand, they do this because the economy is in a very weird state right now, and we will talk about that, and we'll see some videos about that a little later on, uh, maybe in the, in the next lecture. But in general, the banking system has become so complicated, the, the functions, the, the services that the bank, each bank offers even to simple people today, they are very sophisticated and they require some kind of cost. Like, for example, when I have my phone and I take out my phone or my watch and I'm able to just tap my watch and I will uh, have the bank do a transaction for me, this is something that uh, it's not coming for free for the bank. So a lot of banks actually now they apply a, a high fee model. They charge a lot of fees for, for services that they offer in order to make some money. But traditionally, this didn't happen five, ten years ago. Traditionally, the banks, they made their money, they made profits from loaning out money for a higher interest rate to the one that they pay to depositors. Therefore, in normal times, when a bank receives a deposit, it tries to immediately loan this money out. So the ideal scenario is that I go to my bank and I will be like, good morning, I would like to deposit $100. And the teller will be like, oh, sure, of course. And OK, so here is the $100. So she will credit this $100 to my account. And at the same time, she will take the cash, hand it under the table to the next teller and the next teller will be to somebody else, okay, sir, here is your loan for $100. This would be the ideal scenario for the bank, that money would come, up, come in from the one side and go out from the other side directly. So we should not have any amount of time that we lose because this amount of money that the bank holds of mine, they have to pay interest to me and it will cost them money. To, to, to have them in, in as deposits. However, if they loan it out at a higher interest rate than the one that they will give me my interest, they will receive more profit. So this is the ideal scenario, but this will happen only, notice this, in normal times. Normal times means that outside from this bank, in the normal economy, in the real world, there are worthy projects that they will yield with some good probability the return that they should yield in order for the creditor to be able to pay back the loan with the interest to the bank. So in some times, the economy doesn't do very well and therefore the bank will prefer to hold this money in or deposit it to the central bank, and we start observing this a lot the last few months, or maybe a little more than a year already. Every bank, in normal times, try to loan out the maximum possible amount of deposit. The maximum possible amount of deposits will be how many deposits they have, times how much they're allowed, how much percentage of these deposits they are allowed to give as loans. This will be one minus the reserve ratio. So if the reserve ratio is 10%, this parenthesis here will be 90%. So they will be allowed to loan out up to 90% of their deposits. The process of lending money out in a way however, creates additional money. 
So there is a magical process according to which not the central bank that it's its duty to create money, but the commercial banks with deposits, they are able to create additional money. How does this work? Now, assume that the reserve ratio is 10%, and I walk into a bank like before to deposit $100. All right, so if I deposit $100, the bank will reserve $10 and will loan out $90 in cash to someone. So the example I showed you before here, this little act that I did here, uh, involved that the reserve ratio was zero in this particular case. Let's assume now that the reserve ratio is 10%. So when I give $100 to the bank, the bank will credit this to my checkable account. So this means that I still have the $100 that I deposited. I didn't lose them. So I still have them. It's part of the M1 that is in my pocket. All right. So I do have the $100, but then this other guy who was waiting on the other, on the other, uh, on the other cashier, then this person will be able to receive $90 in cash. This means that since I have my $100 that I deposited and somebody else from this $100 was able to receive a loan of $90, and this is spendable hot cash that is in their pocket right now, this means that M1 increased by 90% from this transaction. Now, this person who will receive the loan receives the loan for some particular reason. Let's say, for example, they receive the loan in order to pay some debt. So pays his debt and the guy who receives this money, maybe he will want to go and, and have dinner with his $90, Finally, in the end of the day, these $90 will end up in the pocket of somebody who will put them, deposit them in the bank as usually people do. So these $90 will eventually be spent and they will end up deposited to a bank. Maybe the same bank, maybe another bank, it doesn't matter. All right, so that bank will reserve $9, 10% of the 90 and can loan out 81 in cash. But notice that the person who deposited the $90 into his or her bank, this person still has their $90 in their checking account. So therefore, that bank too will reserve $9 and will loan out $81 in cash. Notice, however, that the person who made this deposit, they still have their $90 that they deposited as credit in their checking account. However, somebody else will be able to get another loan of $81, and therefore, we have another change in M1, an additional $81. Both of these, they started from my initial deposit. My initial deposit of $100 let me have my $90 in my checking account, generated a loan of $90 to the first person and another loan to $81 from another person. This $81 will eventually be spent and they will end up in the end of the day to a bank which again will reserve the 10%, $8.1, and loan out $72.9 in cash to somebody else. This will create another $72.9 as an increase in M1. This $72.9 will be spent circulating the economy, and in the end of the day, somebody else will receive them, maybe I, maybe somebody else. You will deposit them, to another bank or to any of the previous banks. And again, this bank will reserve the 10%, 792, and loan out 65.61. So we have another difference, again, another increase in M1 for 65.61. And this process will keep going on again and again and again. 
So how much money can be generated in total from this $100 initial deposit? This is a good question because so far we have a sum of 90 plus 81 plus 72 plus 65. This is 309 dollars Point fifty one, three hundred nine dollars and fifty one cents, and we keep going. We didn't end there. So how much will be generated here? How much more will keep generating? Because this is something that will keep repeating into the future forever. So how much is the total money creation? The total money creation, if we write it down in a in a calculative way will be 100, which is the initial deposit, plus 1 minus the reserve ratio 100, that's the value of the first loan, plus 1 minus the reserve ratio squared times 100, that will be the second loan, and this will be the third loan, and this will keep going till uh, uh, this e exponent will become uh, infinity. Okay, so this will keep going and going and going and going. So we have here an infinite summation that if you are good in math and you understand abstract notation, you can write it like that. If you understand what this means, this is a short way to write this thing here that as you can see here in the end, this doesn't finish, it keeps going. So this is a short way. The sigma notation is a, is a very a very short way into writing exactly an infinite summation in a very short, uh, in a very short string here. If you do not understand what this means, doesn't matter, don't even bother. It's not, I'm not going to examine you on that or anything. I just put it there so people who understand math will be able to see it in a different way. So it simply says, if you are curious, that this is a summation that starts a summation, an infinite summation of this exponent that takes the sum from when the exponent is zero because this first part here would be a hundred times one minus rr in the zero power. Okay, one minus rr in the zero power would be one, so the first term will be a hundred. So it starts being a zero plus the same thing when it's one plus the same thing when this is two plus the same thing when this is three four, five, up to infinity. So this is how you read that. Summation from i equals to zero up to infinity of one minus rr in the ith power times 100. Okay. If you are interested, bother with it. If you are not interested, just skip it. Stick to what is important. So what is important is that this sequence here, this is a geometric sequence and it's infinite. Now, a geometric sequence, however, has this property that since the multiplier here is less than 1, because 1 minus RR is always less than 1, because RR will be between 0 and 1, and 1 is 1, so 1 minus something that's between 0 and 1 is always a fraction. So when the multiplier is a function, the multiplier of the sequence is a function, then this sequence will be actually contained. It will not become infinity even though you keep adding stuff for an infinite amount of times. You keep adding something. Because what you add becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So this term is 100. This is smaller than 100, smaller than 100, and keeps going down geometrically. So this total summation will be contained and we, call, uh, we can calculate this as this whole part here. It will be 1 over the reserve ratio. If the reserve ratio is 0.1, this will be 1 over 0.1. So it will be 10. So 100 times 10. 100 times 10 will give me 1,000. So therefore from an initial deposit of $100, when the reserve ratio is 0 0.1, we will have a gener a generating a total of $1,000. This 1 over RR is referred to as the money multiplier, the MM. So the money multiplier is the multiple by which money supply can increase 
for every dollar we have in deposits. If you deposit a dollar, the amount of money that will be generated will be equal to 1 over the RR. This is the money multiplier, 1 over RR. Here the money multiplier is 10. 1 over 0 0.1, which is 10. Now, one of the most important, perhaps the most important duty of the central bank is to control the quantity of money. The quantity of money can be controlled by the central bank precisely and exactly with four different ways. The first way is the simplest. By printing new money, printing fresh banknotes or coins, or if you want to decrease the money supply, you can actually withdraw existing money, uh, take it out of circulation. So we will see how this can, can actually happen. So the, uh, the central bank can print new money or can, uh, or can withdraw existing money. And in this way, they can adjust how much money circulates in the economy. Now, again, very important. If there is a billion dollars right now that is in the central storage of the central bank, then this money is not included in M1 because they are not circulated in the economy. They are just in storage. They will be used if there is a need to increase the money supply. So if the central bank collects money and puts it in, in its storage, this money is not part of M1 anymore because it's not circulating in the economy. It's not supplied to the economy. The second way comes straightforward from the previous slide and is by changing the reserve ratio. Changing the reserve ratio directly affects the money supply in an inverse way. So by changing the reserve ratio, you control how much money is generated from each deposit. Therefore, by increasing the reserve ratio, you decrease the money supply. By decreasing the reserve ratio, you increase the money supply because you allow more money to be generated by deposits. The third way of adjusting the money supply, of adjusting M1, is by adjusting another rate, which is called the discount rate. The discount rate is the interest rate that commercial banks pay to borrow money from the central bank in order they cannot close their positions in the end of every working day. What do we mean by closing their positions? We mean by not being able, those banks, to meet the reserve requirements on their own. Meaning that I have 100 billion of deposits and I need to have 10 billion in reserves because the reserve ratio is 10%. And in the end of the day, I see that because several depositors unexpectedly came between 1 and 2 o'clock that my registry was closing, so between 1 and 2 o'clock they came and they withdrew a lot of money or they transferred a lot of money to other banks. Now, instead of having 10 billion in reserves, I have 9 billion in reserves. So I'm short of a billion. Where am I going to find that? The first source of funding would be the overnight market. Some other bank, perhaps instead of having 10 billion, they will have 12. So they should have 10, they have a little more. They wouldn't mind giving you a loan for a night so you will be able to cover your position today, close your position today, and when you open tomorrow, take some actions in order to increase your own reserves. So you buy actually time by receiving a loan from another bank that has excess reserves. Of course, the other bank, in order to give you their money for you to be able to meet your requirements, you will have to pay some interest rate. If no other bank is able to give you a loan or if any other bank doesn't want to give you a loan, then your last reserve will be to go to the central bank and be like, listen, I'm short of a billion dollars. 
I will need an, a loan. The central bank will be, of course, it's our duty to give you a loan, but we will charge you with the discount rate. The discount rate acts as a disincentive so that banks will not be risking very much to not meet with their own means the reserve ratio. So the high discount rate will act as a penalty and the higher it is, they will incentivize the banks to hold reserves, their own reserves, that they will be above the official reserve ratio. So they will be avoiding this last reserve scenario of borrowing very expensive from the central bank. Therefore, the commercial banks, instead of targeting exactly 10% of reserves, if the reserve ratio is 10%, instead of targeting exactly 10%, if the discount interest rate is very high, they will most likely target 11, 12, 13, if it's too high, maybe even 15%. If your actual reserves are 15%, means that you restrain yourself to not give so many loans, so you actually keep the real money multiplier down because the real reserves are higher than the reserve ratio. And the fourth way is engaging in open market operations. In reality, all these four ways can actually work fine and they have no problem whatsoever, okay, in functioning. However, most of them, they have a lot of side effects. Number one, for example, is extremely slow. You have to actually print a lot of money in order to be able to increase the quantity of money in the economy. Number two... If you are changing the reserve ratio, uh, you will be upsetting your banking system all the time. Like, for example, imagine that I target, uh, I, the reserve ratio is 10%. I target 12, so I will be covered. And then the central bank comes and tells me, oh, from tomorrow, the reserve ratio will be 15%. Where am I going to find 3 billion right now? Okay, so the, the second one upsets the system a lot works, but has a side effect of upsetting the, ba the banking system a lot. The third one, adjusting the, the discount rate, is something that it's not very effective after some point, meaning that if you make the discount interest rate 3,000%, like a shark uh, uh, discount rate, this will make uh, uh, the banks to hold like the maximum precaution, so instead of 10%, they will target 18%, and the chance of getting below 18% will be practically zero. So above this, nothing will actually make them to change their, uh, their practices because they know that statistically they will never have to borrow from the, uh, from the central bank, and therefore they don't care if the discount interest rate becomes higher than some degree. Open market operations is the best and the most preferable way, and it happens uh, most of the times unless they have particular reason to apply any other of these three first ways to adjust the money supply, they will go for the, uh, for the number four. But what is the number four? Open market operations. Open market operations is the purchase and sale by the central bank of government securities in the open market. Government securities are promissory notes, usually bonds, that the government has issued in order to finance its debts. Uh, now I'm giving you a rough description, but we will uh, cover them in, in further detail a little later. So the government issues bonds, and then the central bank will be able to buy these bonds and use them in order to adjust the total quantity of money that circulates in the economy by buying them or selling them in the market, in the open market. So open market operations are of two kinds. The first kind is the open market sale. The central bank sells securities to firms and households. So it's the sale of securities 
to the participants of the economy. So this is a function that works by withdrawing money from the system. You sell the papers to the people, the people pay you in money, and therefore the withdrawal of money from the system decreases the money supply. Let's see that in further detail. Here's the central bank, and here is the rest of the economy. So you have some households, you have some institutions, you have some firms here, and they all are part of the economy. Each one of them holds some money. So let's assume that you have eight monetary units out there in the economy because there are eight total stacks of these little green dollars that we have right there. And also, the central bank has in its possession government securities that they probably bought from the, from the government or they may have bought before in the open market. So now, if the central bank, the orange building here, is interested to lower the quantity of outstanding money from eight to seven units, they can make their securities that they hold attractive to the households or to the firms, and they can sell it for money. So, for example, maybe they offer a good price for the security, and this uh, guy from this apartment building there will be interested into buying one of the securities. So now you will see that this guy holds a bond instead of, of cash. So the quantity of cash in this economy has gone down to seven because only seven uh, little blue buildings have money right now. If they want to decrease it, they can keep offering. So this house now bought one, and then this firm bought another one, and they keep decreasing it to five. This can go on, and you can decrease the money supply as much as you want, provided that you make the government securities that you own, make them attractive, meaning sell them to a price that will tempt the households to buy them. We will see how this works exactly in the future. And by keep selling those papers, you actually can lower the quantity of money significantly. Now, let's consider here the exact opposite scenario when you want to increase the money supply. In this case, you will be offering high prices to buy securities that they're outstanding in the rest of the economy. Households and banks will want to sell them their securities. So in this case, the central bank buys back outstanding securities from firms and households in exchange for fresh money. So open market purchase is exactly the opposite process from an open market sale. Open market sale decreases money supply. Open market purchase increases money supply. How does the central bank find the money to buy outstanding securities? Well, that's not a problem at all. The central bank can actually print new money, so there is no liquidity problem ever for the central bank because actually they are the issuer of, of the money. Now, open market operations is the preferred means by the central bank for controlling the money supply because of its precision. You can know exactly, you saw with how surgical precision we could increase the money supply or decrease it from eight to seven to six to five, etc. It's flexible, you can do it very quickly, and it's also predictable by the market. It doesn't upset the system. The market can actually uh, see that you are in, uh, planning to increase the money supply when you are offering attractive uh, prices for, for the government securities. Therefore, the money supply through open market operations, the central bank can actually set the money supply to whatever value it wants. Let me say that one more time. The money supply can be precisely set to whatever amount the central banker wants. To whatever amount this person wants, no questions asked. So we will be plotting here to show you that the money supply versus the price of money the price of money is the interest rate. If you want to use money today instead of tomorrow, the price that you have to pay is the interest rate by taking a loan or by foregone interest rate from depositing your money in the bank. 
The real interest rate is the interest rate that the bank gives you minus the inflation rate. If we assume that we have zero inflation rate here, the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate will be the same. But in any case, here we will be talking about the real interest rate. So if I have a plot here, and this will be my money market plot, in which I have price and quantity. Quantity here is the amount of money. Price is the interest rate because that's how much it costs to consume money, to use money right now instead of some point later. And the money supply will be a vertical line at some quantity here that the central banker wants. So if they want this quantity, they will say, okay, this quantity I want, they will do open market operations till they were able to come up with this exact quantity of money supply in general. Most of the times here we will be talking about this money supply, we will mean the M1. If we mean another money supply, I will try to make it as clear as I can so you will know exactly when we do not use M1. Okay, let's now jump on the other side and try to understand what happens with the money demand. The demand for money, MD, is the quantity of money that firms and households in the economy want to hold. Okay, it's the money that you want to hold, quantity of money that you have on you or that you want to have on you for your transaction reasons. There are three reasons for which firms and households, the participants of the economy, they demand to hold money. The first reason is money that you need to have for your transactions, money that you need to have in order to do your regular everyday transactions. The second one is that money you want to hold on you for unplanned spending, for precautionary reasons, just in case something that you do, have not planned from before comes up and you need to use money in order to come out of a difficult situation. And third, money held for speculation. All right, money held for speculation is money that you have in order to be able to catch fast and quickly a profit opportunity that will come across. Again, money held for your normal transactions, money held for precautionary reasons. This is not what I mean here, the, the rainy day fund that you may have it in bonds or something like that. And if a bad situation arises, you will be able to just cash the bonds and just use this money for uh, whatever reason you want to use them. I'm talking um, about money that you want to have in cash, in M1, in spendable money, to be spent as is. I'm talking about this amount of money. And uh, third one, money held convenient for speculation, money that you have uh, uh, set aside, not uh, in, uh, in any saving or in any asset form, but it's just uh, spendable cash or checking uh, asset in which case you want to use for speculatory reasons. So now we want to investigate the same relationship that we had in the previous graph, the total quantity of money and the price of money. So we want to be able to understand how the demand of money, in other words, the relationship that connects the total quantity of money and the real interest rate behaves in the economy. However, this is not a very simple process because we have three partial money demands, the money demand for transaction, the money demand for precautionary reasons, and the money demand for speculation. So in order to be able to understand the total money demand, we have to understand these three sub-demands and how each one of them relates to the interest rate. So let's get started with the money demand for transactions. For firms and households, income, or in other words, money inflow, is not synchronized with money outflow. Like, for example, 
I'm getting my salary from SMU every 15th of the month, but my spending doesn't happen only on the 15th of the month. It happens continuously through the month. So therefore, I have to have in my pocket some money for my immediate needs, and then maybe some other money I will place them into some savings account or some fixed term account, or I will buy some investment product in order to save it for later. So... Because of this non-synchronization, we have two alternatives for disposable income until we spend it. All right. This is the first, keep it liquid in cash or in checking accounts, keeping it in M1 assets, in other words, money that is able to be spent as is. Uh, The advantage of that is that income is conveniently available for spending, so it's very easy to spend it. You need to, uh, you need to go through no process in order to be able to spend the money. You have it in, in cash in this case, but there is a negative, and the negative is that there is no interest gained. So you have an opportunity cost here. You have interest foregone if you select to put your money into uh, a liquid form. The second alternative that you have is to place your money into an interest-bearing asset, like a fixed-term account or or to buy bonds or to buy any kind of of investment, in other words, that is not liquid enough to be spent as is. The advantage for this is that you will earn interest for your money, but the disadvantage is that in order to cash out these uh, assets, and be able to spend them in the future, you will have to convert them back to spendable money. And then if you do that, you will go through some cost. What kind of cost? The first cost might be trouble. Like, for example, if instead of uh, keeping your money in cash, you go and you buy, uh, let's say, a bond, then you will have to find somebody to buy this bond from you before it expires. in order to be able to spend the money. If the bond expires, it's okay. The issuer of the bond will give you back your money. But if the bond doesn't expire and you want to sell it in the secondary market, as we will see very shortly how this works, then in this case, you will have to pay a broker to do that. Or if you want to sell it yourself in cases that this is possible, you will go through some trouble in order to do that. And this trouble will be time lost and can be translated into a a transaction cost. So both of these methods, one and two, they do have a positive thing and a negative thing that they come with. All right, so firms and households now, they will distribute their, their spendable income between one and two, between liquid or non-liquid interest-bearing assets. Okay, how are they going to distribute it? How much of your money you will keep in cash and how much of your money you will uh, store it in a, in a value that will give you interest rate? It has to do with the relationship of the interest foregone cost and the conversion cost. In other words, you have your plan about when to spend your money and this plan can be served by either keeping all your money in cash, that's the costly method, or you can actually keep some money in cash and some other money to put it in interest-bearing assets till you spend it. How much of this money you will put into interest-bearing assets? You will put as much so the sum of the interest foregone cost and the conversion cost will be the minimum possible. This is a little difficult to understand, I am aware of that, so I have put together an example to show you exactly what is going on. Let's see that. So optimal cash holdings example. Assume that you have allocated $400 to uniformly spend over the next four weeks. Okay, that means that you will be spending $100 every week. The first alternative is to keep this money in your pocket for the entire month. Okay, $400 in your pocket for the entire month. And this will be something, assuming that there is no security concerns, like somebody will steal it from you or you're not going to lose it or something like that. Uh, This would be something that will give you no cost other than 
uh, it, this money will not be able to earn any interest rates for the next uh, four weeks. Now, say that there is also the opportunity to buy bonds. Each bond that you can buy is uh, uh, of $100. You cannot buy 50 or 150 You can buy uh, $100 just for the sake of the example. So you can buy a bond of $100 or, or more than one bond. And each bond will give you 2% per week. That's an amazing interest rate, but it's just for the, for the example. Don't look for it. You're never going to find it. So say that each $100 bond gives you uh, 2% per week, that is that it will give you $2 of return every week, but it costs $5 to cash it. You can buy it for free, you can, you can get it for free with no conversion cost from cash to bond, but if you want to, to cash it, you will have to pay $5. Now, uh, as you see it like that, definitely you don't want to buy this bond for a week, because if you buy it for a week, it will give you 2%, and then you will have to cash it after the end of the week, and this will cost $5, or so $2 uh, is, is the benefit, $5 is the cost, you don't want to do that. But if you keep the bond from three weeks and above, that will give you a benefit, okay? That will give you, if you keep it for three weeks, it will give you 2 plus 2 plus 2, $6, and the cost of cashing it is $5, so you will earn $1 in this case. So let's see analytically what you will be doing for every week. The $100 for the first week, you must keep in cash, and this has nothing to do with the interest rate or the cost of converting the bond, because this amount that you want to spend immediately, uh, the, the bond will not have time to even mature for the week to give you this interest rate of, of, of the $2. So therefore, and since you want to, uh, to spend it in this week, you must keep the first $100 in cash, because you need them to be immediately spendable. All right, the second week now, $100, you can leave them for a week as bonds before the beginning of next week that you want to spend them. So you will also keep them in cash because the bond will give you, uh, you will hold it for a week and then you will try to cash it. So the first week will give you $2, then you will cash it, it will cost $5, you don't want to do that because you will be at a loss in the end of the week. With the third week's $100 now, you can buy a bond that you will keep for two weeks. This means that we'll give you a return of two times $2 equal to $4, which is again below the cashing cost, the transaction cost. So you will also want to keep it in cash. Only the fourth week's $100, you will want to convert it into a bond now because you will be able to keep it for three weeks till the beginning of the fourth week, that is, that you will need to spend it. And this will give you a return of $2 times three weeks equals $6, which is worth it since it exceeds the transaction cost, the cashing cost of the $5. Therefore, with an interest rate of $2 in total, now you will want to hold the spending for the three first weeks in your pocket as cash, that is $300 in cash, and only $100 you will put in bonds. However, if the interest rate increases to 3%, that is, each bond will give you $3 per week, so in this case, what you want to do is that you want to hold only $200 in cash now. This is because in the third week, now the second week, still you don't want to do it because it will give you $3, which does not exceed the conversion cost, but in the third week, the $100 bond will yield two weeks times $3 per week now because the interest rate has increased equal to $6 from the bonds, which in this case exceeds the $5 that you will have to cash this particular bond. And of course, for the fourth week, now you have even a higher incentive to, to convert it into bonds because this will yield three times $3, three weeks times $3 equals to $9, and this uh, definitely exceeds the $5 cost of converting it. So, 
we can figure out now, we can conclude that money demand for transactions is inversely related to the interest rate. This is an example that I should be expecting because according to the law of demand, we have seen in microeconomics that in every market, we should expect that the quantity demanded should go down as the price increases. So we have an inverse relationship between money demand and interest rate, which checks out here. So this is a reasonable demand relationship to expect a negative, negatively sloped sub-demand for transactions uh, uh, with respect to the interest rate. Let's now proceed with the money demand for precaution, which is uh, very similar to the money demand for transactions. Households want to hold money for any unplanned spending. Money that you have in your pocket, in other words, in order to uh, uh, face a difficult situation, a, a situation that you have not predicted. Uh, let me tell you how you can figure out how much is this amount for you. This amount for you would be the amount below which you go to the ATM and you get more cash. Okay, usually we do not do this at zero. You do not expect to spend the last penny and then you go to the ATM and get more money unless you are a college student, in which case my uh, money demand for precaution was exactly zero. And uh, this was because I didn't have a lot of money. I would just spend my, my last dime till I get paid the, the, next, uh, the next month again from the university, especially when I was a graduate student. And uh, this had to, had to do with the fact that when you're a student, you don't have uh, a real income and you don't have a, a, a serious income. And therefore, you, you do not have money even for the basic planned transaction and not set, set aside the... Uh, the unplanned spending. But in general, you will see, if you ask your parents, your, your, your mothers, your, your fathers, your older brothers and sisters, if you have, uh, in case that they have a job and they have some income that comes in in, uh, in uh, 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 amounts of time that can be predictable, you ask them, okay, so how much is the minimum amount of money that you should be holding in order to start feeling the need to going to, to ATM? Okay, so if you have, for example, less than $100 in your pocket, maybe you start need, start feeling the need to go to the ATM to have uh, a little bit more uh, to have a little bit more cash in your pocket because you you don't feel safe to have less than this amount of, of money. So holding more money for precaution will make you feel more security for future unplanned expenses. This is something that. Uh, uh, in general holds true because when you have money convenient, anything that might happen, you know how to, to face it immediately. That would be easy. But again, you have a cost, an opportunity cost of not, uh, of not getting interest here. So still, this is the opportunity cost present, still applies to the precautionary motive as uh, it applies into the transactions motive in a very similar way. Therefore, we can expect that money demand for precaution can reasonably be assumed to uh, be inversely related to the interest rate. The relationship here, again, is similar to the transactions motive. So we have the second sub-demand to be negatively related to the interest rate. However, several economists, they consider that this motive is a little less sensitive to the interest rate because no matter how much is the interest foregone opportunity cost, how high it is, uh, the security feeling is a little more important than, than the cost foregone. So therefore, we assume that the interest rate will affect less, will still affect, affect negative how much money we hold for precaution, but will affect it less than what it affects the money we hold for transactions. So two out of two are negatively related with respect to interest rate. Let's check the third one. The third one is a little more complicated. It's not very straightforward. Let's first of all talk about 
speculation, what speculation is and how exactly it works. A large amount of money in any economy, especially today, is held standby for short-term profit opportunities. Uh, the money demand for speculation is the bigger amount of money that is, is, hold in, is held in the society and in the economy right now in most economies. It's held by big organizations, by speculatory funds, in order to find good profit opportunities. And in good profit opportunities, you have to move very, very quickly so you do not have time to cash your money before you are able to buy those assets that you expect them to appreciate in price uh, in the near future. Now, what is the difference between investment and speculation? I have to tell you that there is no official definition or distinction between the two. However, in most of the cases, what we actually mean when we say speculation is shorter term opportunities than investment. Another, in my opinion, better way to distinguish the two is that an investor is somebody who buys an asset because they expect a return from this asset, meaning that a fixed term return in the end of every month, in the end of every year, etc., etc. So an investor who buys stock of a company, for example, they buy it because they want to receive the dividend from the profit of this particular firm every end of the year, every end of the period that this firm gives uh, gives the, the dividend. A speculator, on the other hand, is somebody who looks for resale, flipping opportunity profit. So a, a, a speculator will buy stock from a company, not because he's going to wait till the end of the period and get the dividend, the normal return that this company will distribute to its stockholders, but it expects it to appreciate and then sell it at a higher price than what he or she bought and get profit from that. So speculation is mainly conducting by, conducted by flipping various financial assets, such as uh, bonds, government securities, in general assets that they are uh, in a market, they have a, a, a globally defined uh, value, generally accepted uh, value, and you can uh, buy and sell very easily and very quickly. Now, let's understand what are the bonds and, and the securities. So a security is a bond that is, is issued by the government. A bond can be uh, issued by the government or it can be issued by any, any private firm. So a bond is nothing more than a promissory uh, note, an IOU note, for the payment of a debt. Like, for example, it's a paper that looks like that. It has some uh, calligraphic... Uh, calligraphic font that says bond and then it has like this nice uh, 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 nice frame that goes goes around there to to show that this is a high value document and things like that usually they are either bluish or greenish or uh, reddish of color and then the creditor provides the initial capital in other words gives you a loan this is called the face value of the bond and then receives by the debtor a paper of a pre-specified duration. And it has an expiration. This particular one expires in the end of uh, 2022, let's say. All right, so this is a promissory, uh, a promissory note that just says that you gave me $100 and you can hold this as a receipt, as proof that I gave you this loan for $100. Now, why should I give you this? Because you will pay me Interest. So the bond contains coupons that each defines a fixed interest payment to the creditor for every period. So now we have 2020. So it's 2020, 2021, and 2022. This has a three-year life uh, as a bond. So it should have three coupons right here. Uh, each coupon will be for each particular year. And it will define a fixed interest payment to the creditor for every period. Let's assume that this payment is $10 per period. 
the expiration when you will receive this $10 is in the end of 2020 for the first, the end of 2021 in the second, and the end of 2022 in the third one. So in the end of 2020, you will just uh, uh, cut this coupon from the, from the bond and will take it to the issuer and will give you $10. You will do exactly the same in 2021, and then in the end, you can not even cut it. You can take the, uh, the entire thing to the, to the issuer, and the issuer will give you the $10, plus also will give you back the face value of $100. Now, uh, some things to note here. First is that uh, today you do not really do the cutting and everything because the exact same principle works in a, in a electronic way entirely. So in most of the cases now, the, the issuers, they do not even issue these papers anymore. That's the first thing uh, to understand. And the thic- second thing to understand is that this uh, uh, bond here doesn't, say, doesn't write your name, doesn't write the name of the person who lent the money. If you own it legally, one way or another, uh, you don't have to be the guy who actually gave the initial loan. You can sell it to somebody else. The owner at the 31st of December of 2020, whoever the owner is, will go and will actually uh, receive the payment of the $10 of of the coupon. So it doesn't matter if you are the, the initial owner or not, there will be a secondary market that these bonds will routinely be sold uh, as, let's say, used bonds, uh, but because it's a bond and it doesn't have any wear and tear, it still gives you the same interest, it's actually something that can be retailed uh, many, many times, and as we saw already, these are routinely bought and sold by uh, by the central bank, when the issuer is the government. Now, after the expiration of the bond, as we said, the debtor pays back the initial capital to to the creditor, or in some cases, you will actually give the bond back and you will get a new bond instead of the $100. You will will actually renew the loan for the same interest rate or for a different interest rate. But in the end of the expiration, in uh, uh, in this date that this uh, bond expires, you can actually give the paper back and receive the, the face value of it. Now, uh, let's try to understand what is the relationship of this bond with the interest rate. The first thing I want you to notice is that anywhere in this, in this paper here, from the beginning that it's issued, it doesn't say anything about any rate. Okay, It doesn't have any percentage value on it that defines any interest rate. The interest rate is clearly defined, but indirectly. So if you gave $100 and you get $10 as interest, this means that 10 is the 10% of 100. So you define an interest rate of 10% in this particular bond. So this bond has 10% per year for a loan that will last for three years. If now you want to liquidize this particular bond, what you're actually doing is that you are reselling it to somebody else. In the old times, when the bonds would be issued in paper, you would actually be able to do this by yourself. So you could go, for example, to your brother-in-law and say, hey, I have this bond by this uh, company uh, issued uh, three years ago. It has another seven years of life in front of it. Uh, Will you give me this amount of money and you have it for my own because I need the money? And if the guy would tell you yes, then you could actually get rid of it so somebody else will assume the loan and will continue the the payment to them. All right, so uh, in this case, you actually do not go back to the issuer and you give them back the bond and they give you back your money. You actually... The loan continues to exist, but now somebody else is entitled to the interest payment and will be receiving the the value back. So this is called the secondary market when uh, somebody sells the bond without being the issuer of the bond. If this bond is resold in the secondary market for $125, let's assume that the buyer now will accept 
for this bond to pay not 100, that is its face value, but 125. This means that the coupon will still be 10, but now will be 10 for an initial value of 125. That's how much you paid, and this is how much you will earn in the end of the period. So the interest rate now becomes 10 over 125 equals 8%. So the interest rate will go down as the price of the bond increased. If the bond is resold in the secondary market for $80, less than its face value, then again the coupon will remain at $10. The coupon here is just printed. Uh, nobody will, will uh, update a coupon just because the price of the bond changed. So therefore, what will actually happen here is that it will become $10 out of 80. This will mean that the interest rate now will become 12.5%. So the interest rate, again, indirectly is defined from the price of the bonds. And it's inversely related to the price of the bond because the coupon is fixed. And if the price of the bond changes, you actually divide the coupon by the new price. And this is what will indirectly give you how much the interest rate is. Now, a question that I get very often from students is if this bond is a value of 100, has a, fa a face value of 100, why would someone accept to pay 125 for it? Well, that's a very simple question to answer. If you bought this five years ago that the competitive interest rate was 10% and now the interest rate, the competitive interest rate is 7%, you will actually be begging to, to pay 80 and buy this uh, bond because it will still give you an 8%, which is more than the prevailing interest rate in the market. On the other hand, if the interest rates have gone up and you can find easily interest rate of 12% in the market, you will not buy this for $100 because $100 will make the interest rate to be 10%. So the owner of this bond will have to decrease the price in order to meet a competitive interest rate uh, in the rest of the market. So people will accept to pay different values than the face value if the prevailing interest rate in the market is actually different. All right, so... What we have established here is a very important result that the price of a bond is inversely related to the interest rate. Price of a bond and interest rate are inversely related. Okay, cool. How we can use that? We can use it in understanding what happens in the money demand for speculation. So in the secondary market of bonds, the prices depend on supply and demand. Uh, how many bonds are placed for sale in relation to how many buyers they are interested in buying them. So uh, this means that prices of bonds are inversely related to the interest rate. And when the prices of bonds are high, the interest rate is low. This directly comes from the inverse relationship of price of bonds and interest rate. So when the prices of bonds are high, the interest rates are low. All right. Now, let's try to put the speculator there also to see how the speculator is going to react. When the price of bonds are high, the speculators want to do what? To buy bonds or to sell the bonds that they have. Since the prices are high and they are speculating, they want to start unloading bonds in this case. So they want to start selling bonds. So speculators want to sell their bonds and hold more money in this case. Why? Because I'm selling the bonds and I'm getting my profits now. I'm getting money because bonds are expensive. So this is when the speculators sell. All right, cool. So when the price of bonds are high, and therefore the interest rate is low, the speculator wants to sell the bonds because the prices are high and they will hold more money. That's one thing. 
It's a little, it sounds a little complicated, but try to bear with me for another two minutes and you will see how easy it will become. When the prices of bonds, on the other hand, are low, the interest rate is high. Why? Because of what we said in the previous slide and also we write it here. Also, as we saw, the price of bonds are inversely related to the interest rate. So when the price of bonds are low, the interest rate, rate is high. And what is a speculator want to do when the price of bonds are low? They want to use their money and buy bonds because now they are cheap and they expect them to appreciate and sell them in the future. So speculators want to buy bonds and therefore they will use their money to buy bonds and they will hold less money. So look at that now. When the interest rate is low, the speculators want to hold more money. And when the interest rate is high, the speculators want to hold less money. Okay, so low interest rate, more money holdings, high interest rate, less money holdings for speculation. So what we actually derive here is that money demand for speculation is also inversely related to the interest rate, but now for very different reasons than what we have seen before. All right, so money demand for transactions inversely related to the interest rate. Money demand for precaution inversely related to the interest rate. Money demand for speculation inversely related to the interest rate. So all three of them, they are negatively related to the interest rate, inversely. So therefore, also their sum, the total money demand, which will denote by M subscript D, money demand, is negatively sloped. We expect that the money demand will have a negative slope. So if we try to put it in a similar graph of quantity and price of money, we will get something like this uh, red curve here, which means that this red curve will be the way that the quantity of money is related to the interest rate. There is a particular reason why I am making this curve here to be convex, and I always draw it as convex, and the reason will become apparent in two lectures from today. Uh, you will see why it happens. So we assume that this relationship becomes less and less sensitive as we increase the quantity of money. And you will see later why this happens. For now, what you have to keep is that this, this uh, curve has a negative slope overall. Here it's negative and decreasing. But however, let's keep that it should be negative because the three constituent money demands are also negatively related to the interest rate. Now, what will make this curve to shift? Okay, this is a demand curve. It's a demand of an asset, some, some kind of a good. And what will make this money demand to shift, to change position? That is, it will make people to want to hold more money at every interest rate. So I'm talking about a change of shifting from a position of MD to MD prime. This can happen for various reasons. The first one is if real GDP increases. If real GDP increases, people will want to hold more money for the transactions because now they will make more transactions since there exists more output out there. So you will have to buy more stuff on average. This is a more wealthy economy. You will need more money in order to be able to make more transactions. So if the real GDP increases, people will want to hold more money for their transactions because transactions will be more. This is a very important result. It's such an important result that is worth naming it. So I want to give it a name and I will call it L1. So this is the result L1, and we are going to use it till the end of the course 
It's one of the two important results that will allow us to connect different markets, the money market, with some other market later. Okay, so here we want to remember this name because this will become important in the future. Again, this says that if I have an increase in Y, in my real GDP, I should expect that people will want to hold more money because since there is more GDP, there will be more transactions and the money will either have to go faster or be more. In other words, you need more quantity of money in order to facilitate the transactions of more output. Another reason is if prices increase. If prices go up, things become more expensive, the amount of money that you have in your pocket will not be enough, you will need to hold more in order to adjust for the new prices. Uh, another reason is if public safety is at risk, money demand will rise. This is a, a factor that is a little bit uh, not very clear. So what do I mean by that? If there is a situation, like for example, what happens now in Syria, it has been found that the refugees that they come from Syria, these are, these are people that they had normal lives in Syria. Some of them, they were uh, very serious professionals, doctors, lawyers, architects, like very... Uh, people that they, they had a, a very normal income right there. So when they are leaving the country and they want to, uh, to go somewhere else, they don't trust the banking system. They have uh, high uh, cash amounts on them. So, so people will stop and they will have like uh, the uh, packs of euros or dollars, American dollars of, of money with them. Why? Because pu public uh, safety was at risk and they wanted to have easy access to their money in order to be able to face difficult situations, like, for example, paying somebody, a smuggler, to, to take them from Turkey to Greece or from Turkey to Bulgaria uh, or anything like that. In some other cases, you might see some different public safety shocks that will decrease the money demand and will shift it on the other side. Like, for example, if there are riots and things like that, you don't want to hold your money in, in cash. You want to convert them to something that cannot be looted from, uh, uh, from your, your home or, or, or your wallet or, or anything like that. So public safety usually will make people to hold more money unless it's of that kind that, that will affect the cash holdings of people in a negative way. And in this case, they want to do the opposite. But I think that you understand what, what I mean here. So the interest rate affects the quantity of money, uh, of course. The, uh, the interest rate that we have on the vertical axis affects the quantity of money that we want to hold for all three reasons. We have already seen that. However... It's not a, a demand, uh, money demand shifter, and it's not a money demand uh, shifter for the same reason why the price of Coca-Cola does not shift the demand for Coca-Cola. The price of money does not, does not shift the demand of money as well. It changes the quantity of money demanded, but not the money demand overall. So let's now try to put the money demand and the money supply into one single graph and see how the equilibrium in the market behaves. The central bank can effectively set the desired money supply that they want. We have already seen that. So the central bank, the central banker will come up with a quantity of money that she or he wants to set and they will set this quantity by conducting open market operations. As we will see, this means that the central bank can effectively set the desired interest rate in the money market. So this is equivalent as setting the, the money supply is equivalent to setting the interest rate. And we will see exactly now why this happens. So... Assume that the central banker can actually investigate what happens into the money market. They'll ask the economist of the central bank to estimate the money demand. There are some specific econometric tools that will allow the economists of the central bank to come up with a very precise shape of where 
the money demand, the total demand of money in this economy lies. And once they do that, if they have now calculated, estimated precisely the money demand, it's very easy for them, since they control the money supply, to set the interest rate that they want. If, for example, they want an interest rate of 2%, it will be very easy for them to just set an interest rate of 2% by setting the money supply at the appropriate level of MS, by making the money supply to cross the money demand at 2%. This is particularly easy to do once you know where the red curve precisely is. If you want to set an interest rate of 3%, you can move the money supply to MS prime. That would be also easy to do. And if you want to decrease the interest rate and to make it to be 1%, you can increase the money supply by conducting again open market operations and you set the money supply double prime MS and this will give you 1%. Now, this means that Money supply can be actually used for policy by the central bank. What do I mean by that? Assume that the central bank has committed to the interest rate R star. Every beginning of the term, they come out and they announce the interest rate. Perhaps you have seen that in the, in the newspapers and uh, in the news almost every quarter. Every central bank comes out and they announce a new interest rate. So... This means that they will set this interest rate. How? By adjusting the money supply to be at this particular level that will cross the money demand at A and will yield the interest rate of R star that they have committed. Now, we saw that there are particular reasons for why the money demand will want to shift to a different place. Like, for example, prices change, like uh, public safety, like uh, uh, real output increases. So you might have the money demand, for example, to shift to a new position, MD prime, in which case the equilibrium escapes from point A and wants to go now to a different point B where the interest rate will not be the one that the central bank has committed, but will be a new interest rate, R prime, which is higher than the interest rate that the central bank has committed. What does this mean for the real world markets? Before money demand increases to the new place, the interest rate was low at R star that the central bank had committed. All right. This meant that there is an equilibrium interest rate. There is a quantity of money that uh, at an interest rate of R star, it will be sufficient for the people that they want to, to, uh, to hold money. They will be able to find this money from the money supply at that particular interest rate. But now... Money demand has increased and money supply has not. So meaning that every dollar now is becoming a little more scarce. Meaning that let's say prices has gone, price level has gone up. So that is what made my money demand to shift to a new position. So my money demand shifted because of inflation, let's say. Okay, this means now that I will want to hold more money, but I cannot do that because money supply is still the same. So there's no more liquidity in the market. There is more need for money, but there is no uh, more liquidity. So this means that in order for me to find the necessary liquidity, I will have to borrow. So I will go to my friend Johnny and I will be like, hey, Johnny, can you give me some more money? Uh, and I will give you when I get paid. And Johnny will be like, Cosmas, I would like to help you out, but also I need more money and I don't have. And I was like, come on, Johnny, I really need it. Just please give me. It's like, okay, I'll give you, but I will give you at a higher interest rate. All right, so you understand here that because money is scarce, people will start giving it only if you give them something a little bit more. And this is exactly the increase that we see from R star to R prime. Now, the problem here is that the central bank has committed to R star. 
meaning that if you have committed to our star and then in the market, in the real market, people borrow and lend at our prime, the central bank actually um, is ridiculing itself and then this should, should, not be, uh, should not be the case. So what actually the central bank can do is conduct some monetary policy and maintain the interest rate to a level R star. So how can they do that? By increasing the money supply, bringing it here to a point that will be a little higher, so they will start to bring it somewhere there, in which point it, the market will equilibrate at C, which C is at the same interest rate that the central bank has previously committed. So this means that if you imagine that there is a commitment on our star and this commitment happens on this axis right here, this commitment, then any change on the money demand on the red curve, red curve shifts on that side, money supply automatically will follow it, so the intersection will always happen in this, on this interest rate. If money demand goes down, there will be open market purchases in this case to reduce the quantity of money, so the interest rate again will be at R star. So in real time, the economies of the central bank, they will follow what happens in the money demand in the economy, they will continuously run their models to estimate where money demand is in almost real time, and they will be able to adjust the money supply all the time, so the intersection will always happen at the interest rate that the central bank has committed. This means that money supply, open market operations happen very, very often because we have changes in money demand very, very often. So for example, a foreign speculator decided to hold more Singaporean dollars. This means that you have an increase in money demand by this speculator holding more dollars, dollars will become more scarce, so the, the central bank has to address this or else the interest rate, the equilibrium interest rate, will not be to what they have committed to. So the central bank acts as a stabilizer of the interest rate and therefore the entire money market in the economy. The money market is a very important portion of the economy in this part of the macroeconomy in this particular country. And their role as a stabilizer of the central bank is extremely important. In the next lecture, we are going to put the money market together with some other markets, the commodity market, the labor market, and some other markets. And we will see, because there is this interdependence between markets, having the ability of stabilizing the money market actually allows for stabilization for the entire economy, and this is very important. Our last topic for today will be inflation. Inflation is a, a very interesting topic. We'll see some uh, interesting things that you didn't know about inflation. Inflation is uh, very usually a, a source of misconception for economics. And I want to, make, to use today's uh, segment of the lecture in order to clear up some things that we should know for inflation. The first thing about inflation is uh, uh, inflation is also related, the level of inflation is also related to the level of GDP. So let's try to understand deeply what happens here. I'm going to show you a slide with minimal math which is, most of it is not arithmetics, but it's just conceptual. And I think once you are careful in this slide, it will be very easy for everyone to be able to understand what is going on. So, from the formula of the calculation of real GDP that we saw in lecture eight, we know that 
we calculate the real GDP by taking the nominal GDP and dividing it by the CPI, by the Consumer Price Index. And this is something that we have seen also from, uh, uh, from the previous lecture. This is how we defined real GDP. We defined it as the, C the, the GDP, the nominal GDP over the CPI. Now, I can just um, write this as CPI equals the GDP over the real GDP. So I can transfer the, the denominator of the right side to the left side and the left side to the denominator of the right side and I will get CPI equals to GDP over the real GDP. Now, these two things, the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the CPI and the fraction GDP over real GDP, are always equal. Why they are always equal? Because they are just defined to be equal. They are coming from a definition, so they are defined to be always equal. If two things are always equal, it means that if one grows, the other will grow too. And they will grow at exactly the same rate. So if the two sides are always equal, then this means that these two things, they will also have the same growth rates. We can write that as the growth of the left-hand side is equal to the growth of the right-hand side. Okay, so this is a, a result that comes directly from the definition of the real GDP. The growth of the CPI, of the consumer prices, is equal to the growth of the GDP over the real GDP. Now, from a simple rule coming from growth mathematics, I can take the right-hand side and I can write it in a more convenient way for me, break it down into two different growth rates. So growth math tells me that the growth of a ratio is the difference of the growth of the numerator minus the growth of the denominator. So I can write this as the growth of CPI is equal to the growth of GDP minus the growth of real GDP. So this comes from the rule that the growth of a ratio that I have here is the difference between the growth of the numerator and the growth of the denominator. So I have growth of my consumer prices is equal to the growth of the GDP, the nominal GDP, minus the growth of the real GDP. All right, so this is again coming from my definition, so it is always true. Now, we have observed from research almost everywhere in the world that the growth of the nominal GDP is equal to the growth of the money supply. This is a result that holds true in, in all economies all the time. The growth of the nominal GDP equals the growth of the money supply. In other words, the central bank increases the money supply according to the growth of the nominal GDP. Therefore, since we have that this thing here is equal to the growth of the money supply, I can write it like that. The growth of the CPI, the growth of my consumer prices, is equal to the growth of the money supply from what the, the central bank does minus the growth of the real GDP. All right, that's interesting. Let me write it now in simple English. Growth of the CPI growth of consumer prices is actually the inflation rate because that's how the inflation is defined, is the growth of prices consumer pay in order to buy a basket of goods. So the inflation rate should be equal to the growth of the money supply that is defined by the central bank minus the growth of real GDP. Uh, I'm very interested in this particular equality here. We derived it by using all that. Now we do not need any of those, so let me clear it out. And then let's move this on the top of the slide here. So now what I want to do is I want to understand what really happens with this equation here. This is a very useful 
equation that will allow us to conceptualize the inflation as we haven't seen it before. So this means that inflation is equal to the gap between the growth rate of money supply and the growth rate of, of real GDP. That's interesting. And here is why it is interesting. Because a lot of people will tell you that if you increase the money supply, you should expect that you will have inflation. All right. So a lot of people will say if the central bank, the Fed, for example, in the US, they print continuously money, this will lead to inflation. This is not true. Actually, it's partially true, which makes it not true as an as a, uh, undebatable result. So this will be the case only if you print money without this growth of money supply to be accompanied by the growth of real GDP. Actually, if you print money at 2%, you, you increase the quantity of money 2% a year, and your real GDP increases by 3% a year, so this means that you will have inflation rate of negative one. How is it possible? You are printing 2% more money. How do you have negative inflation? How is your prices going down? Because you are not printing enough to meet the real needs of people in money for transactions. So you will have inflation only the when the growth rate of money supply exceeds the growth rate of the real GDP. When this gap widens, you will have inflation. Now, inflation will result when the central bank, as we said, prints disproportionately more money than the change in real output requires. So if you print money, this will not necessarily lead to inflation unless you print more money than the increase in your GDP. This equation makes clear predictions about the inflation rate, and we have tested repeatedly these predictions, and we have seen that with no exceptions, these predictions are always correct. So this is a formula that comes from the math, but actually is tested, and it works 100% of the times in the economy. So now you know that if you increase the quantity of money in the economy, you will have inflation only if you have no economic growth also that is at the same, uh, at the same rate. All right, so what are the consequences of inflation? Why inflation is perceived to be a bad thing and governments, they always try to limit inflation. If prices increase by 5%, rents increase by 5%, and salaries increase by 5%, then why should you worry for the inflation? If my landlord tells me that the rent from next term will be 5% higher, and all prices that I see around me are 5% higher, but then SMU increases my salary 5% also, why should I worry? My real purchasing power would be the same. And this is, in fact, the case here. So purchasing power will still remain the same, but however, this is not what happens in reality. Prices and wages especially for some specific categories and groups in the society, they do not move in sync, at least not in the short term period. And increasing the inflation rate, therefore, creates winners and losers in the short term period. Let's see how this works. The usual losers of inflation are those who do not anticipate that inflation will actually occur. Let's see how inflation affects credit relations. So consider here a credit agreement for a car loan. So I will give you a loan of, of $10,000 to buy a car, and in one year from now, 
you will return to me the 10,000 and you will give me also $500 of interest. Okay, so this is a, a simple loan agreement. I'm giving you 10,000 now. You will give me after a year 10 and a half thousand. All right, so this means that in 2020, I will give you 10,000. And then in 2021, you will give me 10,500. This is a simple agreement that we have here. Now, with no inflation, the creditor will receive back the full value of the car. So I'm trying to convert this loan now into real terms. So instead of measuring dollars, I want to, to try to measure uh, uh, real goods and see how in terms of real goods this will work. So with no inflation, zero inflation, the creditor will receive back the full value of the car, that is 10,000, plus a premium for not having access to his money. So I will give you a car that is worth $10,000. Well, actually, I'm not giving you a car. I'm giving you the $10,000, which is equivalent of giving you a car of $10,000. And then uh, in uh, one year from now, you will give me back one car plus a little bit more of a car. Okay, this translating the converting the loan into real terms. All right, so with no inflation, the creditor will receive back the car plus a little more of the car. The car in both cases, you can see here in the price tag, it costs the same simply because we have no inflation. Now, source of misunderstanding number one and what a lot of students have trouble understanding here and I faced this really, really bad last semester in terms that a lot of students, they, uh, they could not understand that and I was unaware that they could not understand it till the very end. So let me resolve it once and for all here. This credit agreement that I'm giving you 10,000 now and you are giving me $10,500 back in the future, the $500, the interest, is not because of inflation. You assume that there will be 0% inflation in this example. So you are not charging an interest of 500 just because you are scared for inflation. The reason that you charge the 500 is because you're giving to somebody the advantage of using your money for a year depriving you from the ability to use your money for this year. So the problem here is that we do not really require an interest rate because of inflation. We require an interest rate because of not being able to use our money and giving our money to somebody else to use it. Plus, we face some risk. What if this guy gets the coronavirus and he dies? who is going to give me back my money afterwards. So you have to get paid the premium just for the inconvenience and the risk. Outside of inflation, this loan agreement causes to the person who will, uh, who will give the loan. Okay, so this is very important to understand. So this is why I require $500 or a little bit more of a car to be given to me. All right, so if now you have an anticipated inflation 10%, the creditor will lose some part of the capital also because what happens is that I'm giving you a car of 10,000 and then since we have 10% inflation, this car next year will cost 11,000. So actually, I'm not even giving you back, uh, you're not even giving me back a car. I gave you a car and you give me less than a car back. All right, so this is because we have inflation that is unanticipated. So not only you are not giving me my premium here, but actually you don't even give me back my, uh, my, uh, my capital that I, I lent you. Even if inflation is below 5%, so an anticipated, uh, an anticipated inflation, let's say it's something like uh, uh, 3% here. 
So if inflation is 3%, I will give you back the entire car because I will return to you 10,500. Since inflation is 3%, the car costs 10,000 now, it will cost 10,300 in the next year. So I'm giving you back 10,500. So I'm giving you back an entire car plus a little bit of the car, but I'm giving you back a little less than uh, of a car than what we had agreed in the beginning with no inflation. So no matter what the interest rate is, an anticipated inflation will hurt the creditors because they will not receive the amount of, of capital that they anticipated after the expiration of the, of the loan. The inflation in general has several other important costs. I will show you here a few. Let's go through them together. Try to focus on them because uh, a few of them are a little difficult to understand. I will try to explain them as good as possible. Let's uh, uh, jump into it so you will, you will be able to see why finally inflation is, is not a good thing. First of all, inflation distorts the distribution of income. Inflation changes the distribution of income. Uh, individuals that they have fixed incomes, like for example, employees that they are in a collective contract, pensioners, public servants, they cannot renegotiate their contracts. Okay, they, they have a contract in the beginning of the period and they are committed to this contract till the end of the period. In very rare cases, the employers will want to renegotiate contracts because of inflation. Uh, it has happened to me a few times when I was in Russia and there was an anticipated inflation because the university had spent a lot of money to hire us to, to go into the job market and this required significant cost of the past of the university. When in 2014 the ruble lost a lot of its value, they renegotiated salaries with us because they didn't want us to leave since this was impo imposed them to a very high cost of being able to replace us. Okay, but in most of employees, this will not happen. If you have a fixed contract uh, employee, then they will not be able to, to renegotiate, they, you will not want to renegotiate contracts with them. So, uh, relative purchasing power will shift from the fixed income people to the people who can readjust freely their income. Who are they? Uh, everybody who can renegotiate at the individual basis their salary, like for example, freelancers, contractors, entrepreneurs. So when you go to the doctor, the doctor has a rate of, let's say, $150 a visit before the inflation. If inflation starts, the doctor will just change his price uh, list and will be like, now the visit costs $175. So they can readjust their, uh, their fees very quickly. The same will happen with a tutor. The same will happen with a plumber. The same will happen with electricity. Uh, everybody who is a freelancer can do that on the spot. So you will have income to be redistributed. The relative purchasing power will change. And those who are on fixed incomes, they will lose because of inflation, purchasing power towards to those who can readjust their incomes. Second, inflation creates administrative costs and inefficiencies. This means that for many firms that they sell a very large amount of products, even a small convenience store, they may carry more than a thousand products and selling and different codes that they are selling. So those people, if they just have to change, imagine that there is an inflation situation that you have to change to readjust your prices every one week, let's say, which happens in many countries. Uh, in some countries, even today, you have to change your prices every day. So for many firms who sell a large number of products, if you want to change your prices constantly, it will require a lot of time or a lot of resources. This means that you should have a few employees that they will dedicate their labor hours entirely to adjusting prices. We refer to that as menu costs. This is a term that was forged by the 
famous economist Greg uh, Mankiw. Greg Mankiw calls them a menu cost because he said that it costs money to restaurants to print menus. They print these fancy menus. And then uh, you will see that uh, if you have to change menus every time that you, to reprint your menus every time that you uh, change the prices, at some point you may actually not want to change your prices just because of the menu cost. So because of this menu cost, this is an inefficiency. You spend money in changing your prices than trying to make your services or your product better. The third social cost of inflation is that it ruins the economic environment by creating uncertainty to firms discouraging business activity. Now, by definition and by construction, business is risky. The reason that most of the firms make high profits is because they are taking some kind of risk. Okay, there is no riskless return in the economy. There always is some reasonable or in some cases very high risk that you have to, uh, you have to face. So firms, by definition and by construction, they face high amount of risks. So the last thing they want is to have to face also risks that they are coming from other sources, for example, inflation. So we should want to minimize the risk in order to create a better business environment. And if we keep the risk of firms down, then we should see firms growing because they are in a better environment. Inflation will create uncertainty because it's usually unanticipated and this will hurt the economic environment. The fourth cost of inflation is that it changes the relative prices, causing market distortion. All right, so vendors who buy supplies with long-term contracts, they will be able to keep the prices lower than their competition. For example, if I'm selling uh, potato chips and I have my potato vendor that I have a contract with them and the contract we have defined the price for the next three years, so price per ton of, of, of potatoes, then this means that no matter what inflation is, since my price is going to be fixed, I am not going to be able to be affected from the inflation. If some other seller of potato chips, my competitor, doesn't have a contract with a potato vendor, for potato supplier, then this means that the potato supplier, because of inflation, will increase the price for them. All right. So one seller will keep their cost constant because they have a contract with a supplier. The other seller will have to face an increased cost because now the supplier will charge them a higher price because of inflation since they do not have contracts. Think about it a little bit. Which sellers have contracts with the suppliers? Usually the big ones. If you are a very big seller of potato chips, you will have contracts with everybody because that's how you work. If you are a small seller of chips, like in a very small uh, market or a very specific good, then you are not buying that much from the supplier of potatoes. The supplier of potatoes will not even bother to have a contact with you. So inflation will actually benefit the large companies because they will be able to maintain lower cost than the smaller competition. And this is another reason why we don't want inflation because it creates an uneven environment of competition and this can actually distort the market in terms that it may make a lot of small firms to go out of business creating an oligopoly or in some cases even a monopoly. So competitors may be driven out of the market changing the industry structure in a way that we have seen when we were talking about oligopoly or monopoly. 
The fifth social cost of inflation is that inflation causes misinformation about prices. All right, under inflation, consumers may have trouble to keep up with the price changes, so they are not able to efficiently distribute their income to what it matters. So you go to something that you were anticipating that it costs 10, then you see that this costs 12, you pay 12, then you go to consume the other thing that you wanted to consume, you see that the price of this has also increased, you didn't anticipate that they will both increase, so now the distribution between the first good and the second good will change and you will not be able to maintain the initial optimal distribution that you have decided before the prices change. So you may uh, have to misallocate income among products just because you don't know the exact price relationship between the two, so you are not able to figure the exact slope of your budget constraint if you go back to the material from the initial lectures, lecture two in particular. Number six, stopping inflation requires counterproductive policies. So governments, they tend to fight inflation by using price controls, usually price ceilings. So when we have inflation, we always observe that the governments will intervene in the economy and they will try artificially to keep prices of some particular goods low, like for example, bread in the West, rice in the East, uh, milk again in the West, uh, gasoline, all these necessary, uh, necessary goods, they will try to, to put price ceilings on them and keep them from increasing in price. This will lower the market efficiency, it will create shortages, therefore also dead weight loss, and in some cases it might lead to black markets, meaning that price is artificially from the government kept low. Some sellers, they may withdraw product from the normal market and sell it under the table to an, a price that exceeds the, the price ceiling uh, secretly in order to make more profit as we have seen in several of those cases happening. Let's now talk about hyperinflation. Hyperinflation refers to particularly high rates of inflation, like uh, the ones we had in Germany in the end of the World War I in the period 1922 and 1923. Inflation back then was in Germany 3.25 million percent. You cannot call that a small inflation rate by any means. This means that prices would double every 49 hours. So not prices will just increase every 49 hours, prices would double every 49 hours. Uh, this is the most notorious level of inflation that uh, a lot of people refer to. However, it's by no means the highest inflation rate that we have observed. Hungary in 1946, after the end of the World War II, had an inflation the number of which I cannot really pronounce, I don't know what it is, like a, a gazillion, 4.19 gazillion percent or something like that. At that number, which is more than the number of stars in the Milky Way, uh, we will see that prices would double every 15 hours. Yugoslavia, even more recently, before it breaks up, in 1993-94, after the civil war, they had an inflation rate of 5 times 10 in the 15th power. That's uh, uh, almost 20% higher than the uh, one in Hungary before. And this means that prices would double every 14 hours. And even though these are some numbers that you were not even born when they, they occurred, uh, there is a state of hyperinflation right now. We have an example of Venezuela in 2018 after the political crisis. 
The, uh, the Central Bank of Venezuela announced in 2019 that the inflation rate of 2018 was 130,000%. Uh, this means that prices would double every seven days. So you have to increase your prices almost every day and double them every seven days, which is not a very uh, easy process to do. You can understand how important the menu cost will be. But the president of Venezuela, uh, Maduro, has you covered. Don't worry about that. The plan is that they will drop inflation in 2019 uh, only a little below than 10,000%. So prices now will uh, double, let's say, every, every one month, let's say, instead of seven days. Uh, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, let's hope that they achieved it because we don't have the official data from the Central Bank of Venezuela yet. And uh, honestly, we don't know how trustworthy the data that they give us is. All right, so inflation rates in general. Let's see what happens around the world. Um, I will allow here for even negative inflation rates in this graph because some countries, they exhibit negative inflation rates. So let's see what happens in different countries. Let's, of course, start from Singapore. Singapore had an inflation rate that seems that it, uh, it is lowered the recent years. It is uh, kept steady under 5% with the exception here of the crisis and a little bit uh, after the crisis. But uh, right now, the inflation rate is around uh, 2 to, to 3%. And we see that this is a, a pretty low level after we saw some turbulence with the oil crisis in the mid-70s and uh, the usually high inflation rates of the, of the 1980s. Uh, if you check the United States, you will see a very similar story. United States has an inflation rate that uh, is uh, a little bit above uh, Singapore's right now. Germany, from when we have the observations for West Germany, we see that is a country that they really care to keep inflation low, something that politicians do because there is this mentality in Germany that after what happened after the first a world war, this should not happen to us again ever. So politicians actually, they will go a long way into trying to make an inflation that is, let's say, 3% to keep it down to 2% because the voters care about it a lot. In uh, Japan, which is a country that traditionally has low inflation rates and, and very often negative inflation rates, we see how they, uh, they evolve through time. China had some turbulence in the 80s and 90s, but now also they have adapted to a low inflation rate. India has an inflation rate that is a little bit higher than the other countries. Uh, you see that for today's standards, India is an outlier, but however, if you check what happened in the 80s and the 90s, the inflation rate that India has now is, is considered uh, would be considered normal back then, but now we will see that in the world in general, we have inflation rates that they are particularly low. Uh, Malaysia also follows the, the same pattern with the rest of the world. You can see also Greece that was in the 80s and the 90s a country with traditionally high inflation. Uh, in the end of, of the 90s, it adapted to, the, to the, an inflation rate that uh, existed in the rest of Europe. And the reason was that the monetary policy moved from Athens to the European Central Bank now, and the Greek Central Bank would not have the opportunity to print money whenever the government needed to spend money to win elections or other reasons like that. So therefore, we had the inflation rate to be able to adapt very quickly according to the equation that we saw before because the euro is uh, by construction a non-inflationary currency. Another very important aspect of inflation is that it can function as a tax. Through the central bank, the government can exercise the so-called printing privilege. That is, the government can print a new series of bonds, can ask from the central bank to print fresh money. The bank will exchange the money for the 
new series of the government bonds. So now the government will have freshly printed money to spend. That is, the government will have the central bank to print some money in order to fund government spending or even to pay back older debt. This is referred to as seniorage, and seniorage generates value for the government through the creation of inflation. In other words, if the government has some freshly printed paper money, how does this money take value in order to be able to buy real goods and services? From where this value is generated? The answer is that when the increase in quantity of money is not accompanied by an equal increase in GDP, in other words, according to the equation that we saw before, we have growth of MS, but not growth of the real GDP, we will have inflation. This means that my money will lose, let's say, 10% of their value because of inflation. Your money will lose 10%. Everybody's money will lose 10%. All this 10% will be in the hands of the government who now holds the extra money and they will be able to convert those into real goods and services or to pay back debt. So those who hold money, they will lose purchasing power, which goes to the government as it spends the newly printed money. Now, seniorage acts like a tax to all money holders. This means that no matter where you got the money from, you will have to pay this tax because it's just that your money loses its value. You cannot say I'm not paying because if you hold M1 money, you will be affected by seniors. This can be a good thing because there are several taxes that one way or another you can actually evade. Like, for example, you can work under the table and not pay the 7% income tax. Or somebody can sell something without a receipt and not pay the GST. Or somebody can charge the refueling of their car to their company and will not have to pay the sale tax in gas. But if you hold money in M1 assets, you cannot avoid paying the seniorage tax, the inflation tax. And this is a good thing because even money from that coming from illicit activities, they can be taxed in that way and they can generate some value for the common good. Now, in general, inflation is correlated with economic activity. In periods of high inflation, we observe that the real cost of labor decreases. The real cost of labor. Not the salaries of the workers, but the real cost of labor. Why does this happen? Because firms can raise prices without having to raise wages of contract workers. Why does this happen? Because you have a contract with those workers, so you are not obli obligated to actually raise their salaries uh, for any reason. This is usually the case, and companies will, in, in periods of inflation, will not go ahead and adjust the salaries of the workers. But in some cases, companies will go ahead and they will readjust salaries. Not usually, but in some extreme cases, they will do it. For example, when I was working in Russia in 2014, we had a, a big inflation wave. Inflation went up to 10%. Some people, they even talked about an unrecorded level of inflation, something about between 14 and 17%. And we saw everything around us to become more expensive. And the university came to everybody who was internationally hired and they readjusted automatically their salaries to what they would be without the inflation. So this means that the university, because they had incurred a very important cost in order to recruit all these people from the foreign market, they didn't want to lose us just because our real salary became lower, so they readjusted their salaries. But in general, this is not something that we observe because simply firms are not obligated to do it. So the firms, in periods of some 
mild inflation, of course, not inflation high enough that will create a bad environment, unanticipated inflation that will increase the uncertainty in firms and all this. We are talking here about mild, controlled, expected inflation, at least expected from the firms. Then the firms will be able to adjust their revenue simply because they are able to readjust the prices. So the revenue side of the firms can actually catch up with inflation. You can increase your prices. But the cost side doesn't have to be readjusted. It's sticky because you do not have to readjust salaries of the workers that they are on a contract. This increases profitability, the fact that you increase prices but your costs stayed constant, and stimulates the economic activity in general. So firms in this case, they will want to increase production because they see the increased profitability. They want to increase production and they will try to hire more workers. So this initial moderate inflation, by increasing a little bit the inflation, you created some heat now in the economy. The economy started working faster and faster. And now the firms, since they want to increase production, they will try to hire more workers. So unemployment will go down. We tend, therefore, to observe a relationship, negative relationship, between unemployment and inflation. So as inflation goes up, up to some point, we observe that the firm's profitability increases and this creates a need for the firms to hire more workers. So unemployment will go down. This negative relationship between unemployment and inflation is known as the Phillips relationship. And there is also a curve that relates inflation and unemployment. It's a negatively sloped curve, and this curve is known as the Phillips curve. Now, the Phillips curve is a short-run phenomenon. The Phillips relationship is a short-run phenomenon, and the reason that it's short-run is the contracts, which is what makes the cost side of profit to stay sticky in the long-run period, will expire and they will need to be renegotiated and they will be renegotiated but now at prices that they will take into account the inflation rate. So in the long run, we tend to observe that the relationship between inflation and unemployment is not negative anymore, but in the long run, we do not simply assume such a relationship simply because contracts expire after some period, then they will be renegotiated, so the cost will be able to catch up with the revenue of the firms. So thank you very much for watching till the end. I will see you again in lecture 10.